Thank you. Yes, it's been, I think this is my fourth B-Sides and Long Con, so I'm pretty happy to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Mike Saunders. Uh, I work for Red Siege. Um, I guess I do represent my employer uh, while I'm here, so whatever. I was too lazy to make a slide deck and Tim had these wonderful templates, so I just used his. So it says Red Siege everywhere. Uh, speaking of that, if you want the slides, get away from the speaker. Uh, red, right here, redsiege.com slash ABM. You can download a copy of the slides, redsiege.com slash ABM. I will put the URL up at the end of the talk. I will tweet it out afterwards. I'm a hard water hacker. Uh, and you can get a copy of the slides. So I'm a principal consultant at Red Siege. I've been around a while. I do some stuff. I have fun. Enough about me. Um, why am I here? I want to tell you that as a pen tester, I think pen testing is broken. What we do as a traditional internal pen test is just, it's broken, it doesn't work. What do we do? We take uh, an SS scanner uh, that we have on probably a Dropbox with Kali or something on it, and we drop it in a customer's network, we plug it into their network, we run Nessus, we have all these noisy scans, then we fire up Metasploit and we start lobbing exploits across the network and catching shells, and it's great. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's not value in doing that. There is definitely value in doing that. However, real world attackers are not coming into your organization in most organizations, like that is in some people's threat models, but in most, people aren't coming and dropping a box on the network. And if they are, they certainly aren't running Nessus scans and things like that, right? So, so we're, we're helping our customers fix vulnerabilities, but we're not necessarily doing a good job of preparing them for attacks that they're likely to face out in the real world. Uh, on the flip side of the coin, from the internal, internal pen test, we have the red team. How many people have had their, their CISO or some management type person like, I want to get a red team? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, they don't want a red team. Because, like, if be a little pedantic, but a real red team is team. It's not like one person. Like, it's a, it's a team of a bunch of people that have different disciplines. They have different skill sets. And you've got a shell Sherpa, and you have your initial access person, and you have a person that's really good in this thing, and the person that's really good in this thing. And they work together. They have redundant skill sets. And they analyze the target for a long period of time and then figure out the appropriate way to gain access to that target based on that target. Combine that with what we're doing, asking the customer, like analyzing uh, the customer's environment, saying what's in their threat model. And sometimes the easiest thing to do in a red team is to throw a brick through the window and get in, right? And then you ask the customer like, oh, well, it's a red team. Can I throw a brick through your window? And they're like, no. Okay, can I take the door off the hinges? I'm like. No, no, like, yeah, we, we expect you to fish, you know, and then you'll get in that way. And I was like, oh, okay, so you just want, like, an external pen test or a phishing engagement. You know, that's not a red team, right? So red teams take a long time. They're expensive because they take a long time, and it takes a lot of analysis. And then you go low and slow. You're trying to not get caught most of the time. As a consultant, most of us don't have the luxury of having an unlimited amount of time. We're like, okay, we got two weeks to do this red team. So that means we have to have a fast pace. We're noisier. We're more likely to get caught. So it's expensive and it's, it's probably not the way the customer wants to go. <sighs> assumed what? Assumed what? So the topic is assumed breach, a better model for pen testing. How many have heard of the term assumed breach? we got a couple people. So for the people who didn't raise your hands, what we're talking about is the assumption that an organization has already been breached. Assume that they've been breached. So it's kind of like doing a red team, except we are just going to accept the fact that we already got in. Let's forget about the initial access factor. Well, whether that is phishing or whatever it is, let's forget about that. Let's start inside the organization with a representative computer, uh, which I'll talk about here in a minute, but let's start inside the organization and see where we can go with that access. But we won't operate like a regular network pen test because we're not doing scans and launching exploits for the most part. And I'll talk about through this talk what we're doing. 
We have two models that we use, two-ish, because there's a lot of variants, but we have the malicious user model, someone who is an employee of the company and wants to cause damage. Uh, for instance, a network administrator for the city of San Francisco that found out his job's going away and he changed the passwords to all the Cisco devices in the network and then locked the city out of the network. That is a malicious user model. Then we have the compromise user. Um, that's something that we test more often and that is the user who has clicked on a link and either given up their credentials or have executed a payload. And both of these models, we want a representative workstation with a representative user to use for the test. And what do I mean by that? So I've got a Lenovo laptop here. How many know about the local privilege escalation in Lenovo laptops? Anyone? There's a couple people, all right. So and for those of you who don't know, Lenovo ThinkVantage software has this uh, vulnerability that if you drop a certain file in a certain location 10 minutes after the system boots, uh, Lenovo does some magic moving some files around and it does that as system. So you now have privilege escalation on the machine. So if everyone in the organization has one of these Lenovo's, and by the way, Lenovo's helpful fix for that, the way they actually got rid of that vulnerability was to retroactively announce the end of life. They came out with an announcement that said the software was end of life six months ago. So that was their fix. So if users, every user in the company has one of these machines and you give me a VM to do the test on, I can't. I won't have the same environment. I won't be able to demonstrate that impact. I may still get you know, privilege escalation, but I may not have that. Same thing with representative user. If I'm supposed to be uh, simulating what happens when Jane in accounting uh, executes a payload or, or submits her credentials, I need to have the same kind of access that Jane has. So I need to be in the same groups. On her machine, I need to have the same software because there may be information disclosures in that software configuration that give me credentials that allow lateral movement or something else. Um, I may have privilege escalation opportunities. So I need to have the same level of access and the same kind of, uh, uh, from an AD perspective, and the same kind of machine that a normal user will have because otherwise it's going to uh, impact my test. This is completely unrelated, uh, but during our test, domain admin is not the goal. It's just a tool. We don't plant our flag there and say we won and walk away. That's just a tool to get where we're going. And I'll talk about that more. Now in the compromised user model, um, we're simulating what happens when a user clicks on a payload most of the time. Sometimes we also do it with what gives uh, uh, credentials and I'll talk about how that works in a little bit. Um, Normally we're having the user execute some kind of custom payload for us, whether that's Cobalt Strike or some other C2 type of framework. And once we have that access, all of our testing takes place over that C2 framework. Um, and we will pivot to remote access through, uh, through like VPN, for instance, if it suits our needs. Now, another way of doing the same thing is shipping, have a customer giving you a laptop that you can use, actually one of their laptops, and you start, and it's just a slightly different starting point. We can do both of those, and we do both of those. Um, as I said earlier, the, the goal of this is to demonstrate what happens when a user gets compromised. So we start on their machine, we've got that laptop or VPN and RDP to a workstation, or they execute a payload for us. And we want to see where can we go with that access. Um, if we're doing the model where we're not doing C2 as a start, we're actually starting with a machine. We're starting with whatever tools are available or what can be loaded. We are not asking the customer to like give us local admin access and make sure that PowerShell is enabled and we have all these tools. We will have whatever Jane in accounting has on our machine at our disposal. And then we can initiate C2 from that point if we think that it helps us. So one question uh, we have frequently um, is about AV or EDR. Should it be disabled on the initial access workstation or should it not be disabled? How many think it should be enabled? How many think it should be disabled? How many think you should talk to the client, find out what their goals are for the test? Because they're, they're separate things, right? Like I can start with AV and EDR enabled, but I may not have a working bypass for AV and EDR when I start the test. So now I'm spending customer dollars in, in my time 
to try to figure out how to get past that AV or EDR. So then how long do I do that? Do I, have, uh, do I spend as long as it takes or do we say we'll spend a day doing it or we'll spend four hours doing it? We talk to the customer, find out what's important to them and they'll say, sometimes they say, we know that AV and EDR can be bypassed eventually so we will just whitelist it, whitelist your payload on the first host, in the first host only, just so we can get the test started. And any other machine we go to after that, we have to contend with AV and EDR. Sometimes we start with it enabled and then we disable it after a period of time, but we have those discussions with the client to figure that out. Now in the malicious user model, it's pretty similar to what we're doing with a compromise user having a workstation. Um, we've got a workstation that we access either physically, they ship it to us, we RDP into it, and the testing starts with whatever tooling is available on that workstation. So if they have PowerShell, we use PowerShell. If they don't have PowerShell, we figure out how to get PowerShell or some other kind of code execution working on the machine and where can we go from there. And AV and EDR will always be enabled in that scenario because the user probably doesn't have the ability to bypass it. Now, I did mention real world tactics in air, air quotes a couple of times. So what do I mean by real world tactics? Well, if we think about threat actors, and I haven't lived in this space in a long time, so I'm sorry for those of you that do and can talk more intelligently about this than I can. But you've got these threat actors, right? You've got bad guys, bad people that want to do bad things to your organization. And they have varying levels of sophistication. And they may be very sophisticated and they want to attack you, but they're not gonna burn custom tradecraft, custom tooling to attack you if they can put password in the password field. So that, that's the point of this, like we, we're simulating, we can dial up our test to simulate more sophisticated adversaries, but that doesn't mean we're gonna use totally sophisticated techniques because if I can use this and not have to burn any tradecraft, I'm going to use this every time. So when I was researching for this talk originally, um, I came across this blog that's up here. Um, it's by the uh, Mandiant Red Team and it's a good read and it's, it talks about a lot of the techniques that I'm gonna talk about during my talk here. So what they did is they had a customer that said, we wanna do a red team. And they set up certain goals. They said, we want you to get to this certain network segment. We want you to get into this particular database and we want you to do something else. So those were the goals that they were set up to do. And they started with phishing. The difference in what we do in an assumed breach test is we assume that the fish was already successful. In this case, they started with phishing, they got credentials, they mapped the customer's perimeter, they found a mobile VPN solution that did not require two-factor, and so they ended up VPNing in through this phone for the entire test. Once they got in, they did targeted curb roasting so that they could find credentials, and I'll talk about that in a bit here, but they did targeted curb roasting, they got accounts that they could curb roast, they crack those passwords, they use those passwords to start pivoting through the network towards high value targets and high value data. And that's what we're trying to do on an, on an assumed breach pen test. We're not launching exploits. Like sometimes we do that, but we're not doing exploiting like we would do in a normal pen test. So the rest of what I'm gonna talk about, most of the rest of this talk, you know, if you're someone that's into pen testing or red teaming and you want to start doing assume breach testing, you can use this as a way to start doing that testing. But if you are a sysadmin, sys blue team, whatever you want to call it, you can use these same techniques to test your organization to make my job harder. And, and Robert was here uh, much more enthusiastically before me um, telling you how to defend your organization. And it kind of made me sad because all the things he was saying, I was like, yep, that would work. <laughs> that would work. That would be a pain in my ass. So um, it absolutely um, use these techniques to make my life harder so that I have more fun. Um, it's really frustrating, but it's more fun when I have to work harder. So again, uh, we're simulating what happens. We're searching out high value targets. We usually do curb roasting. We crack passwords that usually gets us some kind of elevation of privilege. We start pivoting towards the data and we're gathering credentials along the way and we're getting to whatever the goal is, uh, whatever high value targets, high value data is. 
along the way, if we get domain admin, that's great. We will use that to our advantage, but it is not the destination. So I've said pivoting towards high value targets and high value data and things like that. How do I know what that is? You have to talk to the customer. I know it's painful, but you have to talk to the customer. So we have scoping calls. And one of the questions we ask is what keeps you up at night? What about your organization, if it was targeted and if it was breached or destroyed, like would have the most impact? And they're like, oh, that's definitely this database. Tell me more. And then we'll find out some more information about that. That might be where we're trying to go. And if I need to use domain admin to get there, that's all I'll do it. But if I can do it is just Jane and accounting and never have to escalate privileges, that's a pretty good demonstration of impact. Now, when we're doing C2 type communications, we need to do something, we need to route our traffic through somewhere. So we don't want people to know directly where our C2 servers are. We wanna hide them. And that's domain fronting. Now, traditionally domain fronting, you would route traffic through someone else's domain. For instance, Cisco, uh, has a bunch of stuff hosted in the Amazon infrastructure through CloudFront. And whitelist.cisco.com was a frontable domain. So I could route traffic, I could profile my customer, find out they're a Cisco shop. They're probably having some Cisco type traffic. So I can domain front, which is requesting the, the on the URL, if we were thinking about a web browser, would be whitelist.domain.com. But the host header that is being sent would be a CloudFront instance that I control that routes the traffic back to me. So an incident responder looking at it on the surface, they see whitelist.cisco.com. Yeah, we're a Cisco shop, that seems normal. But then if they start looking into it very quickly, you're like, that's Cobalt Strike, or that's Metasploit, or that's whatever, if you actually look at the, at the payload that's going. So then we need to make our traffic look like something else. And that's a malleable C2 profile if you're in the Cobalt Strike world. Um, if you're not, there's other ways of doing it, but in Cobalt Strike, it's called malleable C2. If you have to work with Cobalt Strike and malleable C2, blue screen of Jeff, Jeff Dimmick from Spectre Ops, is the master at writing malleable C2 profiles. So much good information at Jeff's GitHub. Um, one of them, Malleable C2 Randomizer, it'll actually just, you run it and it will spit out a randomized C2 profile for you. That's great, but you usually probably want to customize it more for your specific target. And he has a lot of resources that will help you understand how to do that. For initial access vector, how many people block HTAs in email? We got some people block HTAs in email. How many people block HTAs if people try to download them from a web page? Not a lot. HTAs are still effective. They don't run automatically. Now you actually have to like click it, but that's where the phishing email says like, go here and then click on this thing. Um, HTAs are still effective and you can make them more effective. You can take an HTA, uh, for instance, take a PowerShell payload out of Metasploit or out of Cobalt Strike. You can use Trusted Sex Unicorn to make that more obfuscated. If you do some research, you'll find that you can then take that obfuscated script, pull it apart. There is a portion of that script that you then feed to invoke obfuscation from Daniel Bohannon, which makes it even more crazily obfuscated. And then you can use Nishang's out HTA to create a completely new HTA that is very obfuscated, um, doesn't act like the native Cobalt Strike or Metasploit HTAs and gets past a lot more AV and EDR. Demiguys, Demiguys is another tool. It uses environmental keying to execute your, uh, to make a determination whether it should execute your HTA payload. So if you looked at the page, you would see JavaScript and you'd see an encrypted blob. And the JavaScript is looking at your machine to determine what's your host name, uh, what is your IP address, what is your internal domain name. Whatever envi environmental keying factors like that that you set up and you say only execute if the internal domain name is xyz.com. And if it's xyz.com, it'll decrypt the payload and execute it in memory. If it's not xyz.com, it'll never decrypt and execute, meaning you didn't hit the right target environment. Uh, maybe they opened it up at home, for instance. But it also means that it's not being seen on the wire because it's only getting decrypted in memory. So it's a useful tool. Uh, macros still work, click once executables work. 
You can read all about it here from this NetSpy, Met, NetSpy blog. And these are not the only, only ways of doing it. There are so many more ways of generating initial access. This is just some of it. Now we also need user accounts. Um, how do we get user accounts? And this is useful whether it's external pen test, assume breach, or other kinds of tests. We can use OA and O365 for password spraying even if you do not host your email in O365. Um, we can use uh, Daft Hacks mail, slip, mail Snipers, that's Bo Bullock from Black Hills Information Security. You can spray against OA servers or O365 servers, give it a list of usernames, and give it a list of passwords. And it will spray against ORO365 and tell you whether or not uh, those passwords are correct, which you can now use to get into OR your O365 email. But I will be having a blog article coming out soon talking about how you can do user enumeration in O365 even if you don't have Office 365 email. But if your company has Skype, for instance, or if your company uses O365 SharePoint, even if you host your email internally, there is an interface within the Office 365 infrastructure that we can use to enumerate users and password spray to figure out are those correct. <laughs> um, if you're internally, you can also do domain spraying, uh, internally password spraying with uh, Bose domain password spray. And that has a really nice feature that it goes out and you can give it a list of usernames and passwords, that's one way. <laughs> But another way, it'll go out and grab all the users from Active Directory, look at your fine-grained password policy, figure out what the, the lockout threshold is, and then find all the users that are within one failed guess of their lockout policy and won't run them so you don't lock everyone out. Warning, if you give it a list of usernames and, a, and just uh, a password, you actually say spray these users with this <laughs> password, it does not do the safety checks, and it may lock out everyone in the organization and give you a really bad day. <laughs> not saying I experienced that, but <laughs> trust me. Um, so curb roasting, how many know what curb roasting is, for instance? Okay, that's good, there's a good number of hands. For those of you that don't know, um, magic.gif. That's pretty much how it works, it's magic. Um, so Kerber roasting is an abuse of the way Active Directory works. You can set up what's called a service principal name attached to a user account that is used to run services. And there's some magic happening with Kerber roast tickets being signed with the service account user's password hash. And then that hash is transmitted to you and then you give that, that in a form of a ticket and then you give that ticket to the service that you want to connect to and it's like, all right, you're allowed in. That's really a ghetto fabulous way of explaining it. It's horrible. But essentially what happens is a user says, I want to connect to this SQL server. And they receive a Kerberos ticket which allows them to communicate with the SQL server. And a while later, they want to communicate to this other server over here and they pull a ticket and they connect to that server. That is normal Kerberos behavior. In Kerberosting, we look at all the users that have service principal names and we pull all the tickets at once. And then we try cracking those tickets. Because if we crack them, we have the password associated with that service account. That is not normal because you're seeing one source pull a bunch of service principal names all at once. Normally it's one here, one there. So if you look for event ID 4769 on your domain controllers and you see one user pull 30 of them at once, someone is curb roasting in your organization. That's a dead giveaway. So you can use the normal tools and they work like that and they still work, whether it's uh, PowerView, Tim Medine's uh, original tools, um, this one, Invoke Auto Curb Roast. Uh, they all work great, but they will give you away because of how they work. So I talked about that targeted curb roasting that, that Mandiant did. The ideal way to do it is to grab one, wait a period of time, some random period of time, and grab another one, and then wait some random period of time and grab another one. How do you know what to grab? Well, if you can use PowerView, um, if you read this blog by uh, Will Schrader, Harmjoy, um, you can find out how to curb roast without Mimi Cats, because Mimi Cats also does curb roasting. 
Essentially, these two functions, get domain user dash SPN will give you all the users that have SPNs, service principal names, and then this will grab all the tickets um, if you have it do all of them or you can give it one specific user. And what Mandian did was they queried for users that were in a group like admin. There's admin or SQL because we very find these associated with uh, SQL very commonly. And then they pulled only those tickets and they did in a low and slow approach to avoid setting off any alarms. Uh, Sean Metcalf, Pyrotech, uh, his adsecurity.org site. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with that and you have to work with Active Directory, um, go study the Bible because he has a, it's an amazing, amazing Active Directory resource. But we also mine Active Directory for information. We use Bloodhound. And if you're in Cobalt Strike, you can use Sharphound and execute it in memory. It never touches disk. It's magic. You are going to need to save the output somewhere, and that goes on disk. And this is where no save cache is your friend. Because if you don't, it drops a file called bloodhound.bin on disk. And then you have a bad day. So don't forget that ever again, Mike. So <laughs> bloodhound is good. And it's a, but it is noisy. You can make it stealthier, but it is noisy. How many have ever used AD Explorer? Yeah, a couple hands. It's magic. And Robert alluded to this. He's like, oh, we're going to put a Honey account with the username or with the password in the description field. Um, I laugh because that actually happens in not for Honey token accounts. Some people don't realize that Active Directory schema attributes are visible by anyone who can talk to Active Directory. Um, they think that's hidden. Um, or maybe they just don't realize the implications of what's happening. In large organizations, we see very frequently, not frequently, but probably 10, 15% of the time, there's a password in the description field or in the comment field or the MSFU30 password, which is Microsoft Services for Unix password field, the Unix user password field. There are other attributes where you will find password information, uh, either the password itself or information that will get you the password. Our friends at Black Hills have a great blog about this. AD Explorer is wonderful. If you're on the machine, you can use it in a GUI window. It's kind of like a DS query window. And if you're doing it like remotely through C2, you just execute this command and it will harvest all that information out of Active, Active Directory into a snapshot file, which you can download and then use offline. GPP creds, group policy preference files. Um, these have been an issue for a long time and Microsoft fixed the issue in like 2014. Uh, so you can no longer create uh, these Active Directory, or not Active Directory, but group policy preference files that have credentials that are stored in your domain controller's sysfall. These files are usually used to create a local admin account, uh, to map a drive or a printer or something on a workstation, and they get executed when a user logs in. Um, Microsoft, they, they, it is encrypted, it's an encrypted password, but Microsoft helpfully published the AES key so we can decrypt the password. <laughs> and so we look for those. And that's if you're looking for Honey Token accounts, this is another great way. Because I'm going to search Sysfall, I'm going to do it either with PowerSploit, get GPP password, or I'm just going to do find strings slash whatever C password in Sysfall. I'm going to find any file that has that string in it. But if I don't look at the date on the file, because I know that after a certain date in 2014, Microsoft patched this. So sometime after that, it's been patched. There should be no more group policy preference files stored in the sysfall. But if I'm lazy and I don't look at the dates, you can plant creds in one of these files. I'm going to find it. I'm probably going to use it if I don't look at the dates. And if you're really devious, you could do max stomping and change the time on the file to some time in the past. I'm going to have to work really hard to figure out if that's legit. I'm lazy. I'm probably not going to do that. And you see those creds being used, you know I'm there, right? Like that is a way that you can catch your pen testers and people doing bad things. Uh, lateral movement. So I don't want to just work on the machine that I'm on. Um, unless that gets me to the goal, and sometimes it does, but I need to get elsewhere in the network. I do that by getting credentials. And uh, 
I get those credentials and then I can use something like PowerView and I can use test admin access dash computer name. And that'll test if I have local admin access to just one machine. Or I can do this and it'll test if I have local admin access to every machine in the domain. And I can figure out where I can move. And this is very noisy and surprisingly does not get caught so many times. Like why are you not alerting that someone tried to log in to every machine on the network at once? Like that should give me away, but it doesn't. Like look for those kinds of things, but we don't have to use PowerShell. We can use PS exec. And uh, I think it was Kat, maybe was her name this morning, was talking about don't use, if you're a pen tester, definitely use this. This is great for lateral movement. I love it. It's so easy. But there's other ways to do it. This is not the only way to do lateral movement. It's just some ideas. But this is my favorite. This is my absolute favorite way of establishing lateral movement and winning on every pen test. And that's opening file explorer. I'm, I'm serious, that's actually how it works most of the time, is uh, people think that pen testing is like, oh, it's really awesome, and you're some type of code ninja, or you're, you know, elite hacksaw, and it's like, no, mostly I'm a file archivist. Like, <laughs> I'm just, I'm digging through file shares because someone put a password in a file somewhere on the network. I guarantee you it's somewhere, and I just have to find it. So I'm an archeologist. Um, I can do this uh, and I find elevated credentials, whether it's domain admin or SQL SA or some other elevated credentials. I find them in files. I also find the data that I need to win in files, unencrypted PI, PII, PHI, credit card numbers, source code. Um, this is a fun one, PS read line logs. So Kat was talking about you know using the credential object to pass around. There's two ways you can get a credential object. One, you can say get credential and then it pops up a box and you put in your username and password. And that is the right way to do it. The wrong way to do it is to just dollar sign user equals whack, you know, Bob slash Alice. And then uh, dollar sign password equals password. And then you make a credential object using those two. If you have PowerShell read line turned on, which is basically the bash history of Power, PowerShell. If you do that on the command line, this is a transcript of everything you did on the command line, including your typos, and that password that you typed on the command line will be in there. That file is gold. Look for that. Um, it's gonna be in your user profile and like the app data, roaming, Microsoft, Windows, PowerShell folder, I think. I think that's where it's at. Look for that file though, console host, host history. We also look for source code and sensitive data, whether it's, it's credentials, whether it is um, PII, source code, um, whatever it is that the company cares about, sometimes it's just stored unencrypted in files and we find that. And the other thing that I really like is uh, web.config files. For some baffling reason, system administrators Maybe it's not sysadmins, maybe, I don't know, it's a nefarious developer, I don't know. But they share out the web root of an IIS web server. And if that web server needs credentials to communicate with something else, the credentials are stored in web.config. So if you share that share out and let everyone read it, the credentials to do that are in that file. Oh my God, and it happens all the time, all the time. And they're like, oh, why is that out there? And I was like, I don't know, dude, I'm, I found it. I'm not your test, like, you tell me why it's there, it shouldn't be. Um, we can use PowerView to do this automatically. We can use invoke share finder with check access and it will look across every share in the domain that the user I am currently executing as, that's the important thing, the user I am currently executing as, does it have permission to check that file or check that share on the network? You should see this, you should see me connecting to the system and be like, yes, I have access. No, I don't have access. If you are collecting these events from all your endpoints, and then doing some correlation and you see one person strobe every file server in the network at once to try to see if they have access, it's not normal behavior. Most people aren't doing that. So look for that. You will find people that are doing it programmatically. Um, we can also use find interesting domain share file, which will search through every share in the domain for certain files, files that have the word 
password in the name or cred or admin or other interesting names. There's a few defaults that it looks for and returns that list. So Robert's talk about having a, a honey file, passwords, like that's gonna be interesting to me. And I'm not gonna know that it's not legit until I open it, at which point if you're auditing access to that file, you know I'm there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But if, if people did that all the time and I had to start using other techniques, that would be awesome. So hunting sessions, session files, things like RDP, uh, RDP files that have creds bound to them, uh, SSH private keys, uh, FileZilla and WinSCP configuration files that have passwords in them. You can look for those manually while you're out trawling for gold, or you can use Session Gopher uh, to search either the local system, a remote system, or every machine in the domain, again, that you have access to. If you're doing the malicious user model, or you're doing the model where you start with a workstation and out C2, like Cobalt Strike, you can execute unmanaged PowerShell in memory. So even if PowerShell is disabled on the box, I can still execute PowerShell. If I wanna execute PowerShell on a machine that doesn't have it, there's two ways. There's, there's the ISC. So the ISC, I believe it's the integrated scripting environment for PowerShell. And it's a script pane and then your normal PowerShell cr uh, prompt at the bottom. If you paste a PowerShell script into the script pane and press the play button, is that a script? No, no, it is not a script. It's just data that gets run. It's basically runtime PowerShell. So even if script execution is disabled, the, the I forget the interactive interpreter says, all right, you can run this in the ISE. So I can use the ISE, script execution is disabled, I can still execute PowerShell. If that is taken away from me, caveat with this, you cannot save the file. Because if you save the file, it becomes a script. And now the ISC will say, I can't execute that because it's a script and we have script execution disabled. So do not save it, just paste it in. Another great tool, Brian Furman from uh, Black Hills, Full Metal Cache, has this tool called Powerline. Powerline is a self-contained PowerShell environment um, that you give it a configuration file that says, these are all the awesome PowerShell things that I want to include in my end executable. And I want Mimi Cats and I want, uh, I want all the PowerView goodness and all the other things that you want to do with PowerShell that you can't because PowerShell is disabled. You run the build script, it will pull down all those scripts, consume them and build them into a executable that now you can, execute, you can drop on box and execute your PowerShell scripts from that executable. AV will see it from time to time and uh, it will get you caught. So you have to deal with that. You know, you have to take care of that problem. Uh, but the user, uh, the sysadmin will be blind to the execution. Um, they'll see system.management. or system.automation.management.dll gets loaded, but I don't believe in most, uh, at least in PowerShell, older PowerShell, uh, they won't see the PowerShell actually being the commands with uh, script lock enabled doing this. So, pros and cons of assume breach testing. The whole reason I think this is a better way of doing testing is it gives our customers a good understanding of their strengths and weaknesses as they pertain to more quote unquote real world attackers than a, than a network pen test does. We can model our test using real world tactics, techniques and procedures. So we can be as sophisticated as we want. If we wanna be APT 29, we'll be APT 29. We'll study their tactics and we'll use those tactics. If we wanna be some other APT, we'll do that. Or if we just kind of want to just run the test, let's not model any adversary. Let's just do this test and see where we go. We can do that too. Those are, those are pros. On the con side, as a, con, as a consultant, 
I have a limited amount of time. I'm bounded by weak timeframes most of the time. Client wants a week long assume breach pen test. An attacker has however long they want to compromise your organization. So they can be really slow. They can spend time and do something and then go back to sleep and hide themselves for a long time and then come back and do more things. We don't have that luxury, so we have to be noisier, which means we might get caught. So if we're doing a zero knowledge test, we either get caught or we make less progress in the time we have possibly because we have to be slower. So that's a con you have to be aware of. We are not focused on vulnerabilities. I mentioned that at the beginning. So if your environment is full of MS-1710, unless I'm pulling patch manifests from the local machine, I won't, I won't know that you're missing that patch because a lot of the times in these tests, we're not using exploits. We're just abusing the system the way it works to get to the data. So we may not know that's there, so we will not report on the vulnerabilities. I report on vulnerabilities when I use a local privileges uh, exploit to escalate privileges on a workstation. I will report that there, but I don't have knowledge of what's going on in the network. So the customer doesn't know. And if we don't tell them, does it exist? Depends on the environment. Talked about the importance of representative accounts and workstations. Because again, if I don't have a this Lenovo laptop and everyone in the organization has one, I don't have that privilege escalation vector. If I don't have the right domain groups, uh, for instance, I was doing one of these tests recently and I was a member of the domain users group and the VPN users group. I had no group membership. I had no access to anything. Fortunately, this organization had uh, a Kerberosable enterprise admin account service service principal name with a really weak password that I was able to crack and I was able to get domain domain admin that way or enterprise admin. Um, the other wonderful thing they did for me is they dropped me on the same box that the guy that managed the enterprise password manager used, and he had just deployed that a previous month. And that previous month that he just deployed it, he had, guess what? Spreadsheets full of passwords all over the network. Wow. And so that's the box they put me on and that folder was viewable. So I was like, guys, guys, like that's one of those things where you look at it as a pen tester and you look and you go, this, where's the camera? Like this, this can't be legit. You don't want to use the creds. She's like, there's no way, there's no way they did this. And you sit there for long enough and you're like, I don't know, man, the password on that particular account hasn't been changed in seven years. Like, I think this is legit. Let's try it. And you're like, you are now enterprise admin. And you're like, wow. Day one, hour, 30 minutes into the test. I got bad news, guys. So this is a better way to prepare our clients for the attacks that they're likely to face out in the real world. Um, all right, right on time. Uh, this does require some maturity and client processes though, because if you have a client that has never had a pen test, I have had those, I did one this year, they're not ready most of the time for these kinds of tests. They need some level of maturity. They need some level of hardening because otherwise it's such a mess. How do we even begin? So let's do some pen tests. Let's fix, let's, let's turn off null sessions. Let's disable SMB V1, you know, let's like not have four character passwords. Let's start making the organization more mature because you have to be able to crawl before you can walk, before you can run and before you can fight, right? And this is more like a boxing match with, with an infant if they've never had a pen test before. Sometimes they get lucky, right? Like they got little fingers, you know, but most of the time, um, so we do those pen test cycles before we, we do these. And then we say, let's do this test in three years. And this is how we get ready for that. Um, we need to work with the client to get good accounts and workstations. Like we need to help them understand, tell them the importance why we need these. Because it not only hampers my test, it's wasting their dollars. Like, like they're not getting the value. I can't tell you what would happen if a regular user gets compromised because I don't know. Never saw that picture. So it's a waste of their money for me to not have that access. So it's important to explain that. And I've mentioned PowerShell and Cobalt Strike here a bunch, but these are not the only things that you can use, right? We've got Merlin and uh, Faction C2 and uh, Silent Trinity, I think. 
Uh, Covenant, Covenant's another one. Covenant's another C2 that's, that's up and coming. There's a lot of different C2 frameworks that are out there that we can use. We don't have to use uh, PowerShell. We could use Iron Python. We could use Boolang. How many know Marcello from Black Hills, Byte Bleeder, his stuff? You need you need to yeah well you need to check out Marcello's stuff because he's doing this mind blowing stuff like these .NET languages like Boolang so you can take Boolang embedded in Iron Python embedded in PowerShell uh, and then you can run JavaScript from inside Boolang for your like your payload like it's like payload inception things are nested and nested and nested and there's no visibility for most of this out there like PowerShell you can see but uh, Boolang and Iron Python most people don't have instrumentation to see what's happening there they're like system.management.automation.dll got loaded awesome but they can't see anything else because it doesn't do the script lock locking that PowerShell does so that's a great way and if you're a blue team can you see that if, if someone builds that on your network, will you see, will you know? You should probably try. So uh, those are just some examples. Don't think that I'm saying these are the only way to operate, uh, just examples to get you started. Uh, so that's me. Um, this is me, Mike at RedSiege.com, Hardwater Hacker on Twitter. Uh, you can follow Red Siege InfoSec to get information about our blogs and our webcasts that we're doing, where we're gonna be speaking, things like that, where you can get the next great new t-shirt um not here because i didn't bring them I'm not saying that theirs aren't you just can't get the red siege t-shirt uh and again the slides are at redsiege.com slash abm so if you want them feel free to download them if you have questions afterwards hit me up on twitter hit me up on email if you want stickers there's some on the table out there uh with that any questions yes So the question was, when I'm talking to the clients about their goals and, and trying to figure out what are the things we should attack, what should we target, um, am I trying to get an understanding of their maturity? And that is absolutely true. I'm trying to understand how mature they are. We ask them before, like, oh, we want an assume breach test. Okay, tell me about what you've done for pen testing in the past. Tell me a little bit about what your controls are that are in place so we make sure that this is value for you. Because we don't... It's just no fun to just go into an organization that's not prepared for you, essentially. There's better, there's more value that I could have doing other tests for them. More questions? Yes. So the question is, at what level is the customer? Um, we don't have a target vertical or a, a target organization. Like some companies like, oh, we're focused on healthcare. We're focused on whoever pays the bill. So um, I've done tests for very small. The hardest test I've ever done is for a very, very, very small bank network in South Dakota. And that was a nightmare. Um, that guy's network is a monster. Like it's terrifying how good his security controls are. Um, we've done tests for large hospitals and large financial institutions and everything in between. And sometimes they're very technical people. Uh, sometimes it's, a, it's some type of contractually obligated pen test. And so we're talking to compliance and you know whoever, and they're less technical. Um, however, uh, we, we try to adapt the conversation to them so that making sure that they're understanding what we're saying and understanding the importance of the things we're saying. And our tests are written in such a matter that the reports should be understandable to anyone that has a level of technical pro proficiency. And then we can always consult if, if, they need, if they have questions. Any other questions? Can't tell. I don't. I don't see any. So with that, that's all I have. Well, yes. Yes. I have a question for you. Thank you.